Hey guys, what is up? We are here with a little bit of something new and interesting and something that's been kind of requested, um, a new hacking tutorial. Well, specifically, we're going to be hacking Minecraft to set the time of day in it, but this can translate to a bunch of other cool skills for basically just hacking video games. Um, this is actually based off the book Game Hacking Developing Autonomous Bots for Online Games. Now, there's several chapters in this book, and I'm going to try for one chapter per video. Uh, before we get started, I just want to say thank you so much to my current patrons who help me keep these videos coming. There's a new Patreon perk, the $2 gooder person uh, tier, which gets an invite to the Patreon-only Discord, where you can talk and share ideas with other patrons and myself in a more personal setting. Patreon helps me put out videos on a more regular and frequent basis. If you'd like to help out, there's a link in the description below. And finally, uh, last quick announcement, my apologies. Um, I'm going to try for a schedule. It'll be a new video every Thursday here on YouTube and a live stream every Saturday, simulcasted to Twitch and YouTube. So let's get started. First thing I want to uh, mention is that the first chapter focuses on Cheat Engine. Now, Cheat Engine isn't the be-all, end-all. Um, rather, it's kind of the first step into making a game client do whatever you want. There are a lot of misconceptions around Cheat Engine. Uh, we're using it as it's intended currently. It's a tool to easily find things we want to modify in a game. Basically, we're going to use Cheat Engine to find and modify the current game time in Minecraft. All right, so now that we've got uh, Cheat Engine and Minecraft open, we're going to go ahead and just very quickly go into a single player world where I've been testing a bunch of stuff. So we've got a nice world that has opened for us with a bunch of redstone stuff, ignore that. And what we're gonna go ahead and do is we're gonna go ahead and try and find and change the game time in the world without using any commands. Now how we're gonna do this is we're gonna go ahead and open up in Cheat Engine and we're going to start looking for the variable that we want. Now, I know for a fact that in Minecraft, uh, time goes forward, obviously. I mean, it does kind of make sense. So we're gonna go ahead and time set day. Now we're gonna use a few commands just to start off with, but we're going to change the world without commands. So we're gonna go ahead and set the time to uh, 1000 ticks. So we are going to go and do a first scan. Um, we're going to go for an unknown initial value because we don't actually know. I could have done a value between X and Y because I kind of have an idea of how fast it goes, but we're going to go with an unknown value. So now we're going to say it has increased because this value is, just keeps going up. We know for a fact that time in Minecraft is measured in ticks. So uh, the more ticks, the more time. So if I set time to noon, for example, it will be 6,000 instead of 1,000. So now I know that it has increased in value. We're gonna go ahead and scan. And it will actually naturally increase in value by itself. So we're just gonna go ahead and next scan, and next scan. Next scan. Now this is gonna reduce the list, 42,000 found. Obviously that's a little bit long to uh, search for. So now what we're gonna do is we're going to decrease the time again and we're gonna say decreased value. That way it'll get rid of a bunch of stuff. There we go. So now we're down to nine total addresses and now we increased the value increase the value again, and here we go. Now we have two variables, and I know for a fact that just by testing them, they are both the time variable. Now, why are these two variables the time variable? Well, the way Minecraft works is uh, ever since I think 1.8, I believe 1.8 made this change, there is a client and a server even in single player worlds. That's why when you go ahead and uh, open to LAN, um, there's just a button there that does that. That's because there's a client and a server running in your client now. So now I just double click these to add them down to here. And here is where we can go ahead and modify them. I'm going to give them a description. So we're going to say time one and we're going to say time two. There's a server time that actually sets the time. And then there's a client time that updates after the server has set the time. Now, my guess is just by looking at these values increment, the one that's incrementing before the second one here is the actual server time and the client time is just updating based on the server time. That's my guess. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do 
is I'm going to go ahead and set what I think is the server time to 1000. And we'll see if that worked. So 1000, we're going to go ahead and set it to, let's say, 6000. And look, it just jumped up. Okay, so let's set it to maybe 13,000. And it's night. And maybe let's just go back to 1,000 again. And it's day. So we have successfully set the time in the world with Cheat Engine. Now, what does this allow us to do? Well, you'll notice here that these variables are in black. Um, if you do more scanning, and if you do some experimentation on your own, you'll notice that a few of them are green. Now, the difference between a black and a green address, I guess, instead of a variable, sorry, an address, is that a black address is something that's dynamic, whereas a green address is static. So a static address will never change. You get the starting initial starting address of the actual game itself. Then you add an X amount of, of uh, bytes to that address to get a static address. There will be a few static addresses and they'll point to all sorts of fun dynamic addresses. It'll, you'll follow a pointer chain that just goes from static address to a dynamic address to another one to another one to another one. And eventually you'll get to one of these addresses. Now you can change these addresses, but every time you open up the game, these addresses will change. And in fact, every time you load up a new world, these addresses will change. So you can change the time, but only for this one session unless you find the static address and follow a pointer chain to this dynamic address and then in code change that yourself. There's a few ways to do that. Uh, one of them is by again using Cheat Engine to follow the pointer chain yourself. Now this is a bit more complex to do in something like Minecraft so I'm actually going to show you an example that was written exactly for this book. Okay, so now you'll see the actual executable that was shipped with this book. So there's actually a repository of executables for you to try out in this book. What I have here is Cheat Engine uh, pulled up specifically for this game. I've actually already found the pointers to this game earlier. So this ball has an X variable and a Y variable. Now currently they're at an unknown value and the reason is because and the last time that I opened this up, the, these were the actual addresses that the ball X and ball Y were at. This is no longer the case because these were dynamic or black addresses. Now the pointer scan results that I have here are when I scanned for the actual pointer chains for these uh, X and Ys and I found the one that actually goes from the starting initial value to this new X and Y value. And you can see the new address of the X and Y here are actually not correct. So I can actually set these addresses to the uh, new ones here real quick. So we'll go 00E519, uh, 58. And so, You'll see here that it now changes to 15 because that is the correct address. Now I can actually change, whoops, not this. Uh, well, I can see the actual pointer chain here from static address or static green address to a dynamic uh, black address all the way down here. So I'm following a pointer chain that says this address goes to here, then it goes to here, then it goes to here, then it goes to here, then finally it goes to there. This is where the actual variable lives. So if I change this one, I go 17 you can see that the ball moves. And I go here and it changes to uh, 14. Uh, well, the ball moved, I promise. <laughs> um, so the idea of this one is that uh, each level, um, this ball X and Y actually end up resetting. So I will show you here in a second. So let's say that I do, I think, what, what was it? I think it was like 27 and then three or something like that. Oof, wow. I've done way too much on this. So if I hit tab to begin the test, you're gonna see that it's gonna reset. And not only is that gonna reset, but this value is completely and totally wrong. And that's because these addresses have now changed. Every time that, the, that it resets, these values change again. So the goal here is to get, is to have this ball in the winning spot, i.e. here, uh, 50 times in 10 seconds. So we're going to go ahead and open that back up. And right now we have the, again, the values in the wrong in the uh, wrong places, except for the point to scan results. Now, again, I'll show you how these work in a second, but I, I promise. But I wanted to show you what happens. 
So let's say we change this over to 27 and 3 once again. And this time we're gonna freeze these uh, results here. And now we're gonna take a look and we're gonna go ahead and hit tab. And we're gonna try and see if we can win this game. And it turns out we can because we've actually frozen these. Now these X's just mean that this variable is frozen. Anytime that the game tries to change its variable, Cheat Engine will detect that and change it back. So I've frozen the pointer scan results, and even though these addresses have changed, as you could see every single time the level reloaded, the pointer scans or the pointer chains did not. So now I'm gonna show you exactly how I get to the pointer scan from the actual temp result that I want. So let's go ahead and reopen the uh, memory pointers.exe once again, and we're going to take a look. Okay, so as you can see here, we have the memory pointers.exe open once again, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at the temporary variables and see what we can go to find where maybe the uh, green static variables, or I'm sorry, I keep calling them variables, they're actually pointers, green static pointers actually are. So we're going to go ahead and do a first scan. Obviously, since we know the exact values, um, we're just going to use those. The interface is pretty intuitive. You can find it yourself, obviously. But since we know the exact values, it'll be a little bit easier to do this. And we're going to say the value is 15. We're looking for the X currently. So we're going to do a first scan. And you can see, again, we found the static uh, addresses here, but none of these are actually correct because, again, these um, values uh, are a pointer chain. So we're going to go ahead and skip those for now, but we're going to move it across along the X and we're going to say the values change to 16. And immediately we have found the new address. So as you can see, this is, this is the correct address, but we have found it. Now, how do we get from this black address to a green address? And that is the kind of ultimate question that you have to ask when you um, are looking at simple games like this. Um, obviously, more complex games are going to be harder to find. Um, they're going to have things like maps and um, very advanced structures that hide these variables quite well. But in this simple game, the question is, how do we get from this black address to a green pointer scan or, or sorry, a green static address via this pointer scan? Okay, so this is a bit more of a complex topic, but I'm gonna go ahead and try and go over it as smoothly as I can here. So we're gonna go ahead and um, I have set these addresses to the correct addresses now. I, I've known what these addresses are. I've just gone ahead and done that. But um, I'm going to go ahead and we're gonna assume that we have found the correct addresses using this. We're gonna go ahead and do a pointer scan for this address. Now, this dialog box will open and there's quite a few options to consider here, but we're only gonna pick out a couple. Now, one of the ones we're, we're gonna change here is we're gonna change this eight to a six. I have an eight core processor, but I don't want it using up all my cores because, uh, yeah. Another one of the things that we're gonna change is we're gonna change it max level from a five to a 15. Generally, you wanna keep it around apparently six or seven according to the game hacking book. But for this particular example, it's actually a bit finicky and you're going to want a max level of 15. Another one that we're going to change is we're going to change this 3 to maybe a 6 or a 7. Um, now, again, according to the book here, this uh, limits the number of same value pointers that this scanner checks. That is, if n different addresses point to blah, this option tells cheat, cheat Engine to consider only the first M addresses. This can be extremely helpful when you're unable to narrow down your results set. In other cases, you may want to disable it as it will miss many valid paths. Again, a lot of times you're going to want that to leave that at kind of the default uh, around 3 to 5. But in this one case, unfortunately, the game doesn't really follow what the book is saying convention should be, and we're going to have to set that to a little bit of a higher value. And once again, we're going to leave the maximum offset value to 2047. Um, the book actually recommends about 128, but once again, we're just going to like do a kind of a broad um, shotgun approach to this uh, because, the again, the game doesn't seem to follow what the book is explicitly saying. But we're going to go ahead and leave that there just so that we kind of get everything. And finally, we're going to hit OK, and we're going to let the pointer scanner do its thing. We're going to just uh, name it test because that's fine. It doesn't matter too much. 
and we have a lot of results. Now I had a ton more when I first started this and all of them do point to this one variable at 16. So the question is, which one is the real one? The answer is kind of all of them, but some of them are gonna change. Um, technically, currently they're all correct. They're all gonna point to that one variable, um, that one pointer with 16 as the value. So the question is, which ones are gonna change? Well, the answer is you have to use some entropy. You have to start moving things around and see which ones change. And if none of them change, you might actually want to go ahead and start moving the ball around. Still, none of them seem to have changed. Okay, so a couple of those pointers are no longer valid, but we know for a fact that this ball is still on the screen. And we, know, and we can see here that the ball X and ball Y are still at 16 and 13. So a couple of these are actually invalid, which means that they're invalid paths that we don't want. We're gonna filter out those invalid ones. We're gonna save it. And now we've slightly reduced our results. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna open up the game again and we're gonna keep going. We're just gonna do this one more time. All right, we've reopened this and we see that uh, 13 and 15 are here and we see that a few of these are no longer valid. So we're gonna go through all these and we're gonna check each one and we're gonna validate each one. So each of these now point to valid addresses and each of these no longer point to a valid address. That means that each of these should work or one of them should work. So what I did was I basically just kind of went through, I, I did this over and over again. I reopened the game and I closed it and I reopened it and I tested it. I hit the tab to you know test it, filtered out all the invalid uh, pointers. And eventually I came down to these two pointer scan results, which allowed me to use these as actual pointers. And as you can see, they work, work perfectly. Every time it the game restarts, this value and this value always point to the correct circle position. Yes, that. And so that allowed me to create this program here, which basically emulates this whole freezing of the, of the pointer scan. Um, this pointer scan will go from address to address to address to address, and it will eventually you know, hit the correct pointer for the X and Y value of the ball. This does exactly the same thing. It just goes from address to address to address to address and eventually hits the X and Y value of the ball. And once it gets those addresses, it will change them constantly to 27 and three, which is exactly what this does just by hitting the, these two uh, X, X's here. So I've recreated this functionality, but in a program. Now what I can do with this program is I can distribute this program or I can you know, say, oh, hey, I've managed to hack the game, yada, yada, and I can actually run it. So I hope this video taught you a bit more about how game hacking actually works and between uh, my, you know, reading this book and making the videos on it, hopefully I'll go ahead and read more chapters and figure out exactly how all of this works and then share that information and knowledge with you guys. So as always, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. If I see more of that, I'll of course do more of this. And uh, one more time, my apologies, the new Patreon perk, the $2 gooder person <laughs> tier, gets an invite to the Patreon-only Discord uh, where you get to talk and share ideas with other Patreons and myself in a more personal setting. So you get to go ahead and get to share your ideas or maybe say, hey, I'd like to you know, see a video on this or this and I'll actually see it and read it. And as always, thank you so much to my current Patreons who help keep these videos coming on a more regular and frequent basis. If you'd like to help out, there is, once again, a link in the description below. As always, I'll see you next time.